So uh, we'll, I'll talk uh, a bit about uh, JAK inhibitors. Brian already introduced the, the sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor, so I'll skip through that sort of quickly, and then we'll talk about SMAD7 uh, antisense for Crohn's disease. So the uh, JAK uh, pathways, Bruce has introduced a little bit, and you can see there's uh, JAK uh, or Janus kinase 1, 2, and 3, which mix and match across a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, as well as some hemopoietic uh, uh, pathways like erythropoietin. And so depending on the relative um, binding affinities of uh, small molecule JAK inhibitors for JAK 1, 2, or 3, you can dial in or out the selectivity uh, and emphasize uh, more JAK1 or JAK3, or for a variety of hematologic conditions, uh, the emphasis would be on binding uh, JAK2. And if you're trying to dial out uh, unwanted side effects, then you, you'd look for something that might hit one pathway uh, more than another. So we'll talk a bit here about uh, the drug that we have data for in IBD so far, tofacitinib, or CP690550. This is a novel small molecule oral JAK inhibitor, currently approved for rheumatoid arthritis, and is, um, is in phase three testing for both psoriasis and ulcerative colitis. Tofacitinib inhibits uh, JAK1 and JAK3, a little bit of JAK2 at higher doses, but there's more functional uh, specificity for JAK1 and JAK3. And it ends up modulating a variety of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including interleukin 12, or 2, 4, 7, 9, 15, and 21, so a fairly wide uh, uh, immune modulating effect. There's a variety of uh, JAK inhibitors uh, in the clinic, several of which are being evaluated for IBD. Tofacitinib has been uh, tested in both ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. I'll show you the phase two data, and we'll see the phase three induction data for that next year. Uh, ABT-494 is a JAK1 inhibitor that's being uh, uh, evaluated in both rheumatoid arthritis and Crohn's disease. And uh, GLP, uh, or GL, uh, PG634 uh, uh, is another JAK inhibitor. There was a press release last week that it met its primary endpoint in uh, Crohn's disease, so we'll expect to see some data on that drug probably at uh, meetings uh, this next year, but there's nothing public that I can uh, talk about today on that. This is actually my favorite JAK inhibitor. It's uh, approved for uh, dogs who have uh, atopic dermatitis. This is one of my uh, little dogs who has steroid-dependent atopic dermatitis and was driving me crazy with itching and barking, and he's happy now and steroid-free. Um, so uh, let's look at tofacitinib in ulcerative colitis. So this is uh, moderate to severe ulcerative colitis uh, and looking at the primary endpoint, which was clinical response at uh, week eight, you can see that uh, the higher doses of tofacitinib, uh, 10 milligrams and 15 milligrams twice a day, had significantly greater response rates than uh, placebo. And you can also see this no nice dose response across 0 0.5, 3, 10, and 15. So for a phase two trial, when you can see the higher doses uh, hitting and dose response, you know that this is uh, likely a real uh, signal. Um, switching to uh, clinical remission, here you can see that the highest two doses, again, were uh, significant, uh, with 48 and 41 percent of uh, patients achieving full clinical remission compared to 10 percent of placebo. And again, you see the dose response, which seems to plateau for remission at about 10 milligrams uh, BID. And then here's endoscopic response. So this means that patients came into the trial with a Mayo Clinic endoscopy score of two or three uh, on a range of zero to three. And then to have endoscopic response, they need to downgrade that score, starting with a three or uh, two or three and finishing with a zero or one. And here you can see again that the higher uh, uh, doses uh, achieved uh, endoscopic uh, response more frequently than uh, placebo. And then here's endoscopic uh, remission and uh, the endoscopic remission rate. So this is getting from a two or three all the way to zero. Only 2% of placebo treated patients achieve that compared to 30 and 27% of patients at the higher uh, doses. 
So uh, really a nice uh, data set for a variety of clinical and endoscopic uh, endpoints. It's short term, uh, relatively small numbers per patient group. So obviously this needs to be confirmed in uh, phase three trials. And then we need to see the maintenance and understand the safety in this patient population. But at least for induction, this is really uh, a nice signal. And I think we'll, the, the phase three induction trials uh, uh, for ulcerative colitis, there are two of them have been completed, and you should see those uh, data at major meetings uh, next year. Let's switch now to Crohn's disease. And here the story is a little more complicated. This was a four-week trial, and you can see that tofacitinib doses of 1, uh, 5, and 15 milligrams were not more effective than placebo for uh, a clinical outcome measure based on the CDAI of uh, clinical uh, remission. And uh, then we looked at biomarkers. So here's uh, the change in C-reactive protein for patients who had uh, elevated C-reactive protein at baseline. And you can see the highest dose, 15 milligrams, did result in a drop in CRP can, uh, relative to the uh, lower doses and uh, placebo, which didn't change uh, much at all. So this suggests that there's biologic activity uh, with this molecule at high doses in Crohn's disease. Whether that will translate into clinical activity, we would have to see. And, and there's another um, phase two trial with Crohn's disease that I think has been completed, and you'll probably see the data for that uh, next year. Here's fecal calprotectin, where it was the same story, really no change in fecal calprotectin amongst patients who had an elevated fecal cal at baseline uh, for placebo or the lower doses, and then a drop in fecal calprotectin uh, for the highest dose, again, suggesting uh, biologic activity in the Crohn's disease uh, setting. So what about side effects? Uh, I've sort of pulled this out of the prescribing information. Uh, it sounds kind of FDA-ish. Uh, severe, sometimes fatal infections have occurred. Tuberculosis and uh, other opportunistic infections have been reported. Uh, 11 solid cancers and one lymphoma out of about 3,300 patients. Uh, taking tofacitinib with or without uh, methotrexate compared to uh, no cancers in a much smaller control group of 809 uh, patients, plus or minus uh, methotrexate. There were rare cases of uh, gastrointestinal tract perforation in patients who had uh, diverticulitis. A little hard to tell how real that signal is. That's also been seen with uh, interleukin-6, anti-interleukin-6 monoclonal antibodies in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. One thing that the uh, JAK inhibitors can do is raise uh, lipids. It's a complicated picture. They raise not only LDL lipids, but HDL lipids. So what the net cardiovascular effect is when you're raising both is not uh, entirely clear. About 10% of patients will have a clinically important uh, rise, and there's actually been a randomized controlled trial uh, of a statin to lower uh, lipids in patients who had a significant rise in rheumatoid arthritis, and not surprisingly, statins work uh, for that indication. Um, let's see, went the wrong way here. Uh, you can sometimes see uh, liver enzyme elevations. That's not a huge issue with this drug, but you can see it occasionally. You can sometimes see uh, lymphopenia, neutropenia, and at the higher doses, occasionally anemia. So those are the uh, jack two uh, effects that are uh, sort of carrying over a little bit in some uh, patients. Patients need to be uh, monitored. The monitoring would be very similar to what you're used to doing with azathioprine and 6 mercaptopurine and methotrexate, where you uh, monitor uh, liver enzymes and uh, a CBC, and uh, withdrawing the drug leads to uh, reversal. I think the frequency of uh, lymphopenia and neutropenia is considerably lower with this drug than it would be with azathioprine and 6-MP. From a pregnancy perspective, it's category C, meaning that risk cannot be ruled out, and it uh, is feticidal and teterogenic in rats and uh, rabbits, so probably not something you would uh, consider uh, using during uh, pregnancy. Um, I'm going to skip through this pretty briefly because Brian uh, touched on it already, but just to the, the mechanism of this is important, and I think you'll want to get used to this, so it's worth uh, going through again. So sphingosine 1-phosphate uh, is a lipid that is present on the lymphatic endothelium of the lymph, chan lymph channels that, are leave uh, that allow egress from uh, lymph nodes. It's shown here in the blue triangle, so you can see this 
drink gradient of thing is seen one phosphate and then there are the receptors the s one p receptors that sense that gradient of lipid and that's how lymphocytes that express the s one p receptor get out of lymphocytes so what these s one p modulators do is lead to internalization of the receptor so they go inside the cell the cell the lymphocytes can no longer sense the s one p gradient they get retained or trapped in the lymph nodes and stay there until they senesce or die and so when you treat patients with these drugs you'll see a selective lymphopenia of a subset of lymphocytes and then the lymphocytes that get in are the lymphocytes that express CCR7 which is only a subpopulation of all the lymphocytes that are circulating uh, in your body and so uh, you end up uh, having protective immunity generally preserved because effector uh, memory T cells are CCR7 negative so they don't actually traffic through lymph, lymph nodes and so you're leaving that part of your immune system intact and that is generally thought uh, to be why there's not much of a signal for infection with this class of drugs as opposed to say alpha-4 uh, in integrin inhibition with natalizumab where you have the signal of PML that Brian uh, talked about. And then you saw these data earlier. This is a treat straight through trial. So many of the other studies that you saw with anti in fact all of them were the maintenance data were randomized withdrawal trials so you took the induction patients and took only the patients who responded to drug and randomized them to continue drug or placebo by contrast this trial treated straight through so these maintenance data are not re-randomized responders and selected patients they're you know it's the patients you started with so what you can see is there's actually a rising rate of uh, remission over time in patients who continue on this drug. So it's a little bit slower uh, acting, uh, analogous to the relatively slower acting anti integrin agents. But uh, even without re randomizing, you can see quite a nice uh, uh, maintenance signal as you get out to uh, six months. And here's the uh, analogous uh, data. Response is a little bit um, unlike uh, remission. Uh, the, the response at six months here is artificial because if you were not responding at week eight, you crossed over to open drug. And so uh, by definition, if you were not a responder at week eight, you didn't have a chance to be a, a responder later. So on the previous slide here, if you were a responder but not a remitter at week eight, you had the chance to convert from a responder to a remitter, and that's in fact what happened. But um, if you were not a responder, you, you didn't have that chance because you crossed over to open drug. And then here's the mucosal healing rates over time, and you can see uh, good mucosal healing rates, which are durable uh, out through six months, again, in a treat straight through design. So the maintenance data here are really quite encouraging and uh, robust. And I think Brian's already uh, talked about the uh, toxicity, so I'll leave that alone. The last thing I want to talk about just for a few minutes is SMAD7 uh, antisense oligonucleotide based therapy uh, initially for Crohn's disease but this is going to be tested or is being tested for ulcerative colitis as well. So this is a little bit complicated and let's just uh, think through this. In the gut of healthy people uh, TGF1 beta is produced by many cell types uh, binds to the uh, TGF beta receptor type 2 and promotes phosphorylation and activation of TGF uh, beta receptor type 1. So the TGF, TGF beta receptor type 1 phosphorylates and activates both SMAD 2 and 3. This leads to an interaction of the activated SMAD 2-3 uh, with SMAD 4 translocation of the complex to the nucleus and suppression of a variety of inflammatory uh, or pro-inflammatory uh, genes uh, leading to proteins. So in the inflamed gut of patients with IBD, uh, there's another inhibitor, SMAD7, which interacts with TGF uh, beta receptor type 1 and prevents this uh, SMAD23 correlation and thus uh, pre uh, prevents the TGF1 beta uh, mediated suppression of uh, inflammatory genes. So you block the suppression or uh, i.e. unleash the genes. So uh, Mondrosen is an oral SMAD7 antisense. It's uh, delivered orally through a 
delayed release formulation that releases in the ileum and the right colon, and this phase two study from Italy and Germany that was published in New England uh, earlier in the year targeted uh, patients with ileal and right colon uh, disease. So this is sort of the delivery system that would be uh, similar to controlled ileal release budesonide that you're uh, used to using. 166 patients with uh, active Crohn's disease, 220 to 400 CDAI scores, 61% of the patients had an elevation in C-reactive protein. Uh, you had some normalization of uh, CRP, but you can see this really uh, dramatic effect on clinical remission at the higher two doses and clinical uh, response. And so, uh, you know, this is obviously a, a very interesting signal. Uh, there's currently a study going on. The endoscopy was not done in this study, and from a regulatory standpoint, the FDA is now requiring endoscopy as a co-primary endpoint in Crohn's trials. So there's a smaller study going on at the moment to look at the endoscopic healing properties of this drug, and once that's a little bit better understood, then a large phase three program uh, will be uh, uh, initiated uh, in the near future to look at this drug in, in Crohn's disease in the phase three setting. So in conclusion, there's a variety of new oral therapies for IBD, including JAK inhibitors, S1P receptor modulators, and SMAD7 antisense that look promising. And I think uh, all of us recognize the uh, convenience of uh, oral dosing and uh, look forward to seeing some of these molecules make it into clinical practice. Thank you.